Hello, guys and gals, and uh, this is part 30 of our reading of George Orwell's 1984. Now, we finished the story itself in the last video, but we have some other things to do. We will start by, um, of course, going over the copyright information. I don't want to forget that. This is a 1961 copy of the book, and it clearly says that all rights are reserved. Okay, right here. All rights reserved, including the right to reproduce this book or portions thereof in any form. But first of all, let's read about George Orwell and find out more about the author. It says here, George Orwell was the pen, the pen name of an Englishman named Eric Blair. He was born in Bengal in 1903, educated at Eton, and after service with the Indian Imperial Police, in Burma, returned to Europe to earn his living writing novels and essays. He was essentially a political writer who wrote of his own times, a man of intense feelings and fierce hates. He hated totalitarian, totalitarianism and served in the Loyalist force in the Spanish Civil War. He was critical of communism, but was himself a socialist. He hated intellectuals. Also, he was a literary uh, critic. He distrusted, he, he distrusted Kant. He, wait, he distrusted Kant? Um, he distrusted Kant and lying and, um, cruelty in life and in literature. He died at 46 of a neglected lung ailment, leaving behind a substantial body of work, a growing reputation for greatness, and the conviction that modern man was inadequate to cope with the demands of, of his history. Okay, so we read that. Now, we're going to be reading Appendix, the, the Principles of Newspeak. Newspeak was the official language of Oceania and has both devised to... And had and had been devised to meet the ideological needs of Ingsoc, or English socialism. In the year 1984, there was not as yet anyone who used Newspeak as his sole means of communication, either in speech or writing. The leading articles in the Times were written in it, but this was a tour de force, which could only be carried out by a specialist. It was expected that Newspeak would have finally superseded Old Speak, or Standard English, as we should call it, by about the year 2050. Meanwhile, it gained ground steadily, all party members tending to use Newspeak words and grammatical constructions more and more in their everyday speech. The version in use in 1984 and, and embodied in the 9th and 10th editions of Newspeak Dictionary was a provisional one that contained many superfluous words and archaic formations, which were due to be suppressed later. It, it is with the final perfected version as embodied in the 11th edition of the dictionary that we are concerned here. The purpose of Newspeak was not only to provide a medium of expression for the worldview and mental habits proper to the de devotees of Ingsoc, but to make all other modes of thought impossible. It was intended that when Newspeak had been adopted once and for all, and Old Speak forgotten, a uh, heretical thought, that is a thought diverging from the principle of Ingsoc, should be literally unthinkable, at least so far as thought is dependent on words. Its vocabulary was so constructed as to give exact and often very subtle expression to every meaning that a party member could properly wish to express, while excluding all other meanings and also the possibility of arriving at them by indirect methods. This was done part, partly by the invention of new words, but chiefly by eliminating undesirable words and by stripping such words as remaining as remained of unorthodox meanings and so far as possible 
of all secondary meanings whatsoever. Or whatever, you know, what, whatever. To give a single example, the word free still existed in Newspeak, but, but it could only be used in such statements as the dog is free from lice or the field is free from weeds. It could not be used in its old sense of politically free or intellectually free since political and intellectual freedom no longer existed, even as a concept, and were therefore of, necessar of necessity nameless. Quite apart from the suppression of definitely her heretical words, reduction of vocabulary was regarded as an end in itself, and no word that could be disp uh, dispensed with was allowed to survive. Newspeak was designed not to extend, but to diminish the range of thought, and this purpose was indirectly assisted by cutting the choice of words down to a minimum. Newspeak was founded on the English language as we now know it, though many Newspeak sentences, even when not containing newly created words, would be barely intelligible to an English speaker of our own day. Newspeak words were divided into three distinct classes, known as the A vocabulary and B vocabulary, also called compound words, and the C vocabulary. It was. It will be simpler to discuss each class separately, but the grammatical punk, uh, peculiar, peculiarities of the language can be dealt with in the section devoted to the A vocabulary, since the same rules held good for all three categories. The A, the A vocabulary uh, The A vocabulary consisted of words needed for the business of everyday life, for such things as eating, drinking, working, putting on one's clothes, going up and downstairs, riding in vehicles, gardening, cooking, and the like. It was composed almost entirely of words that we already possess. Words like hit, run, dog, tree, sugar, house, field, but in comparison with the present-day English vocabulary, their number was extremely small, while their meanings were far more rigidly defined. All ambiguities, ambiguities and shades of meaning had been purged out of them so far as it could be achieved. A new speak word of this class could simply be a staccato sound expressing one clearly understood concept. It would have been quite impossible to use the A vocabulary for literary purposes or for political or philo for philosophical discussion. It was intended only to express sim simple pro proposive thoughts, proposive, yeah, proposive thoughts, usually involving concrete objects or physical action. The grammar of Newspeak had two outstanding peculiarities. The first of these was the almost complete interchange, interchangeability between different parts of speech. Any word in the language, a principle this apply, in principle this applied even to the very abstract words such as if or when, could be used either as verbs, nouns, adjectives, or adverbs between the verbs Oh, between the verb and noun form, when they were of the same root, they were never. In, there were never. There was never any variation. This rule of itself in, involved the destruction of many archaic forms. The word "thought," for example, did not exist in Newspeak. Its place was taken by "think," which did which did duty for both noun and verb. No etymology. Etymology. Uh, Etym etymological principle was involved here. In some cases, it was the original noun that was chosen for retention, in other cases the verb. Even, even when a noun and verb of kindred meaning were not etymologically connected, one or, one or other of them was frequently suppressed. There was, for example, no such word as cut, its meaning being sufficiently covered by the noun like the, the noun verb knife. Adjectives were formed by adding the suffix full to the verb form. The, the adverbs by adding wise. Thus, for example, 
Speed 4 meant rapid, and speed Y is meant quickly. Current, uh, certain, uh, certain of our present-day adjectives, such as good, strong, big, black, soft, were, were retained, but their total number was very small. There was little need for them, since almost any adjective, adjectival meaning could be arrived at by adding full to the, to the noun verb. None of the now existing adverbs were, verbs was retained, except for the very few already ending in Y's. The Y's termination was invariable. The word well, for example, was replaced with good Y's. In addition, any word, this again applied to, in principle, to every word in the language could be negative negatived by adding the, the, the affix un. It could be strengthened by the affix plus, or for still greater emphasis, double plus. Thus, for example, uncold meant warm, while plus cold and double plus cold meant, respectively, very cold and superlatively cold. It was also possible, in, as in present-day English, to modify the meaning of almost any word by prepositional affi affixes such as ante, post, up, down, etc. By such methods, it was found possible to bring about an enormous diminution of vocabulary. Given, for instance, the word good, there was no need for such a word as bad, since the required meaning was equally well, was equally well, indeed better expressed with by ungood. All that was necessary in any case were two words formed, formed a natural pair of opposites, was to decide which of them to suppress. Dark, for example, could be replaced by unlight or light by undark, according according to preference. A second distinguishing mark of new speak grammar was its regularity, subject to a few exceptions with a mention oh, which are mentioned below. All inflections following followed the same rule. Thus thus in all verbs and preterites Verbs, the preterite and the past participle were the same and ended in ed. The preterite of steal was stealed. The preterite of think was thinked, and so on. Throughout the language, all such forms as swam, gave, bought, spoke, taken, etc., being abolished, all plurals were made by adding s or es. All the cases might be. Oh as the case might be. The, the plurals of nouns, uh, oh no, the plurals of man, ox, life, was man's, ox's, life's. Comparison of adjectives was invariably made by adding er, est, good, gooder, goodest. Irregular forms and the more, most for, formation being suppressed. The only classes of words that were still allowed to inflect irregular, irregularly were the pronouns, the, re, the relatives, the, the demonstrative adjectives, and the auxiliary verbs. All of these followed their ancient usage, except that who had been scrapped as unnecessary, and the shall should, the shall should tenses had been dropped all their uses being covered by will and would. Uh, there were also certain irregularities in word speech, no, in, um, in word formation, arising out of the need for rapid and easy speech. A word which was difficult to utter or was liable to be incorrectly heard was held to be ipso facto, a bad word. Occasionally, therefore, for the sake of euph euphony, extra letters were inserted into a word, or 
and archaic formation was retained, but this need made itself felt chiefly in connection with the B vocabulary. Why so great an importance was attached to ease of pronunciation will be made clear later in the essay. The B vocabulary the B vocabulary vocabulary consists of words which had been deliberately constructed for political pur- purposes. Words that that is to say which not only had in every case a political implication, but were intended to impose a desired mental attitude upon the person using them. Without a, f- a full understanding of the principles of Ingsoc, it is difficult to use these words correctly. In some cases, they could be translated into old speak or even into words taken from the, vo- from the A vocabulary, but this unusually demanding the, demanded a long paraphrase and even and always involved the loss of certain overtones. The B words, which were a sort of verbal shorthand, often packed, oh, packed whole ranges of ideas into a few syllables, and at the same time, more accurately and forcibly than ordinary language. The B words were, in any case, compound words. Compound words such as a speak right were, of course, to be found in the A vocabulary, but these were merely convenient abbreviations and had no special ideological color. They consisted of two or more words, or portions of words, welded together in an easy, pronounceable form. The resulting amalgam was always a noun verb and inflected accordingly to the original rules. No, the ordinary rules. Excuse me. To take a single example, the word good think, meaning very roughly orthodoxy, or if one chose to regard it as a verb to think in an orthodox manner, this inflicted as follows. Noun verb, good think, past tense and past participle, good think, present participle, good thinking, adjective, good think full, adverb, good think wise, verb noun, good thinker. The B words were not constructed on any etymological plan. The words of which they were made up could be any part of speech and could be placed in any order and mutilated in any way which made them easier to pronounce while indicating their their derivation in the word crime think thought crime for instance the think came second where whereas in think poll th- thought police it came first and in the latter word police had lost its secondary symbol because of the great difficulty in securing euphony irregular formations where commoner oh were commoner oh, were commoner in the B vocabulary than in the A vocabulary. For example, the ad- adjectival form of many true, many packs, and many love were respect were respectively many truthful, many peaceful, and many love lovely, simply because true, truthful, packsful, and loveful were slightly awkward to pronounce. In principle, however, all B words could, in, could inflect and all inflected in exactly the same way. Some of the B words had slightly sub, s- subtilized meanings barely intelligible to anyone who had not mastered the language as a whole. Consider, for example, such typical sentence from a Times leading article as old thinkers unbelly feel ingsoc. The shortest rendering that one could make of this in old speak would be those whose ideas were formed before the revolution cannot have a full emotional understanding of the principles of English socialism. 
but this is not an adequate translation. To begin with, in order to grasp the full meaning of the of the new speak sentence quoted above, one would have to have a clear idea of what it meant by ingsoc. And in addition, only a person thoroughly grounded in ingsoc could appreciate the full the full force of the word belly feel, which implied a blind enthusiastic acceptance difficult to imagine today, or of the word old think, which inextricably me mixed up with the idea of wickedness and decadence, but the special function of certain newspeak words in which old think was one, was one was not so much to express meanings as to destroy them. These words, necess uh, these words necessity necessarily, oh, few in number, had had their meanings extended until they contained within themselves whole batteries of words which, as they were sufficiently covered by a single comprehensive term, could now be scrapped and forgotten. The greatest difficulties facing the compilers of the new of the Newspeak Dictionary was not to invent new words, but having invented them, to make sure that they meant, well, to make sure what they meant, to make sure that is to say, what ranges of words they cancelled by their existence. As we have already seen in the case of the word free, words which had once borne a heretical meaning were sometimes retained for the sake of convenience, but only with the undesirable meanings purged out of them. Countless, wor countless other words such as honor, justice, morality, international, internationalism, democracy, science, and religion had simply ceased to exist. A few blanket words covered them, and in covering them abolished them. All words grouping themselves round the concepts of liberty and equality, for instance, were contained in a single word, crime think, while all words, um, while all words grouping themselves around the concepts of objectivity and rationalism, were contained in the single word, old thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Greater precision would have been dangerous. What was required in, the part, in a party member was an outlook similar to that of the ancient Hebrew, who knew without knowing much else that all nations other than his own worshipped other than his own, worshipped false gods. He did not need to know that these gods were called Baal, Osiris, Moloch, Astaroth, and the like. Probably the less he knew about them, the better for his orthodoxy. He knew Jehovah and the, command, and the commandments of Jehovah. He knew, therefore, that all gods with other names and other attributes were false, god, for false gods. In somewhat the same way the party member knew that knew what constituted right conduct and the exceedingly vague generalism generalized terms he knew what kind of depart, departure from it were possible his sexual life for example was entirely regulated by the two two new speak words sex crime sexual immorality and good sex chastity sex crime covered all sexual misdeeds whatever. It, it covered fornication, adultery, homosexuality, and other perversions, and in addition, normal intercourse practiced for its own sake. There was no need to enumerate them separately, since they were all equally culpable, and in principle, all punishable by death. In the sea vocabulary, which consisted of of scientific and technical words, it might be necessary to give specialized names to certain sexual aberrations, but the ordinary citizen had no need of them. He knew, knew what was meant by good sex, that is to say, normal intercourse between man and wife, for the sole purpose of begetting children and without physical pleasure on the part of the woman. All else was sex crime. In Newspeak, it was seldom possible to follow a heretical thought further than the perception that it was heretical beyond the point. Oh, beyond that point, the necessary words were non-existent. 
No word in the B vocabulary was ideologically neutral. A great deal, no, a great many were euphemisms. Such words, for instance, as joy camp, forced labor camp, or mini packs, ministry of peace, i.e., ministry of war, meant, meant almost the exact opposite of what they appeared to mean. Some words, on the other hand, displayed a frank and contemptuous understanding of the real nature of oceanic society. An example was troll feed, meaning the rubbish, the rubbishy entertainment and spurious news which the party handed out to the masses. Other words, again, were ambivalent, having the connotation good, which applied to the party and bad when applied to its enemy. But in addition, there were great numbers of words which at first sight appeared to be mere abbreviations and which derived their ideological color not from the meaning but from their structure. So far as it could be contrived, everything that had or might be political, political significance of any kind was fitted into the B vocabulary. The name of every organization or body of people or doctrine or country or institution or public building was invariably cut down into the familiar shape. That is a single, easy pronounced word with the smallest number of syllables that would preserve the original derivation. In the Ministry of Truth, for example, the records department in which Winston Smith worked was called RecDep. The fiction department was called FICDEP. The teleprograms department was called Teledep, and so on. This was not done solely with the object of saving time. Even in the early decades of the 20th century, telescoped words and phrases had been one of the characteristic features of political language, and it had been noticed that the tendency to use abbreviations for this kind of this kind was most marked in totalitarianism totalitarian countries and totalitarian organizations. Examples such examples were such words as Nazi Gestapo um, Kami Comintern um, Impracor Agitprop and the beginning, the practice had been adopted, as it were, instinctively, but in Newspeak it was used with a conscious purpose. It was perceived, and thus abbreviated a name, one narrowed and subtly altered its meaning by cutting out most of the associations that would otherwise cling to it. The word communist... Uh, International, for instance, called up a composite picture of universal human brotherhood, red flags, bar um, barricades, Karl Marx, and the Paris co uh, Commune. The sec, the um, the word Comintern, on the other hand, suggested merely a tight knit organization and a well defined body of doctrine. It referred to something almost as easily recognized and as limited in purpose as a chair or a table. Common turn is a word that could have been uttered almost without taking thought, whereas communist international is a phrase over which one is obliged to linger, at least momentarily. In the same way, the association called up by the words like mini-true, are fewer and more controllable than those called up by the Ministry of Truth. This accounted not only for the habit of abbreviating whenever possible, but also for the almost exaggerated care that at which was taken to make every word easily pronounceable. Okay, we are going to pick this up in the next episode. We still have a, quite a ways to go here, it looks like. But, um... We've been reading from George Orwell's 1984. If you like this content, make sure you like and subscribe and ring the bell so you know when I upload. And if you support me in any way, all that information will be in the description below. As always, thanks for watching, everyone, and have a great day.